This episode of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast is sponsored in part by Law Enforcement Labor Services in Minnesota. Law Enforcement Labor Services, also known as LELS, is Minnesota's largest public safety labor union with over 7,000 Minnesota public safety members serving in all areas of public safety. Law enforcement, 911 dispatch centers, corrections, public safety administrative support personnel, and firefighters. Established in 1977, LELS serves over 260 different public safety agencies and over 450 locals across the state of Minnesota. With their administration, general counsel, three staff attorneys, and 14 business agents, LELS provides contract negotiations for better wages and benefits, grievance processing and representation, discipline representation, mediation, and arbitration, assistance with representation for post-board hearings, and in-line-of-duty death benefits for survivor families. Find out more about Law Enforcement Labor Services at LELS.org. LELS.org. This is a special edition of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. Officer Down Memorial Podcast. Officer Down Memorial Podcast. Officer Down Memorial Podcast. Talking about suicide or death, comments like, I wish I were dead, or what's the point of going on, or soon you won't have to worry about me, giving away cherished possessions, a change in appearance, inappropriate use or displaying of a weapon, reckless behavior at work or in their personal life, impulsive or aggressive tendencies. All of these are warning signs for first responder suicide. Some signs may be less noticeable. Increased alcohol use, sometimes after work, sometimes during work. Sleeping too little or sleeping too much. Being more withdrawn or isolating. Being a first responder, serving as a first responder, a cop, a firefighter, an EMS person, a paramedic, the amount of acute stress these men and women endure on a daily basis is daunting. They see things you can't unsee. Cumulative stress that chips away at them. Stress that changes them. It's an incredibly rewarding yet unforgiving career. The career of a first responder. Not long ago, it was believed that PTSD and cumulative stress were issues only in the military. An average of 22 veterans commit suicide daily in the United States. Did you hear that? An average of 22 veterans commit suicide daily in the United States. Those are frightening numbers. Staggering to think about. And most of us either know somebody or have somebody in their family that has served or are serving in the military, myself included. Now, Boston University reports that suicide is the number one cause of death among active duty soldiers, with nearly one quarter of our soldiers struggling with PTSD at some level, at some degree. We now know that mental health issues and suicide ideation threatens our first responders, too. In the United States, we lose an average of 184 cops a year to suicide. That's those that are reported. Most experts believe that that number is low. According to the Firefighters Behavioral Health Alliance, 79 firefighters died by suicide in the United States back in 2023. According to the CDC, the leading cause of death for paramedics in our country is, you guessed it, suicide. If you're a 911 dispatcher or a public safety telecommunicator, the CDC reports 17 to 24 percent of you have symptoms of PTSD and nearly one in four have symptoms of depression. Data from the National Violent Death Reporting System from the CDC indicates that first responders make up 1% of all suicides from 2015 to 2017. When broken down by response discipline, 58% of these suicides occurred among law enforcement officers. 21% were firefighters. 18% were EMS providers. And 2% were public safety telecommunicators. Some of the biggest challenges first responders face who are struggling are lack of resources for help, lack of support from their agencies, the 
stigma of mental health in these career fields, the fear of being taken off the job or losing their badge or losing their identity. One of the most downloaded episodes on the Officer Down Memorial podcast is the Corey Slifko story. Now, Corey was a South St. Paul police sergeant who lost his battle with PTSD back in 2019. He left behind a beautiful wife, Katie, and his amazing kids, Ethan and Maya. Corey's story is told by his fellow officers and his wife, Katie. Corey was a cop's cop. They'll tell you he was a cop 24-7. His, one of his challenges was he couldn't turn it off. I mean, he was, he was just that guy. He was larger than life. One of those guys, always first to volunteer, the first one through the door to help, first to check on you to make sure you're okay, first to tell you to call him 24-7 if you need help, but he was the last one to ask for help. Corey's story is such an important one to share, not only to honor and remember Corey, but as Corey was always there to help people, his story continues to help show families and friends what can happen when one of our heroes is struggling and doesn't get the help he or she needs. Corey's story has helped break down those barriers. Corey's story has helped to lessen that stigma of mental health, of PTSD within law enforcement. His story has helped to get people to talk about it, to talk about their struggles, and to remind our heroes that they're not alone and that there is help out there. If you're a first responder, a first responder friend or family of a first responder, we really highly recommend you check out Corey Slifko's story. In Minnesota, there is a wonderful organization that's been dedicated to ensuring first responders in that state have a resource, a place to go, a support system with and from people who understand their careers and the stressors that come with it, the stress from those calls that you can't unsee. This organization is called the Invisible Wounds Project, and this month, during Suicide Prevention Month, we talked with founder and executive director Russ Haynes about their organization and their mission. Before we get started, let's uh, introduce you to our listeners, Russ. Tell us a little bit about you and your background. Yeah, so I, uh, I started in public safety in 2000, in 17 years. Um, when I got out of high school, I wanted to you know, be a police officer. I'd always wanted to be a police officer. Got into a little trouble in high school, but had some great mentors along the way um, that encouraged me to get back uh, you know, to follow my dreams. So I got into law enforcement, became a police officer and corrections officer, and then, you know, things just didn't quite work out the way it had originally planned. Um, and then I ended up working in 911 dispatch for 10 and a half years. So over the course of my public safety career, ten, uh, 17 years, police directions and 911 dispatch. And then, you know, in 2015 is where I really, I had hit rock bottom and was looking around for help, really couldn't find any. Um, I had you know, suicidal ideation. And, and at that point, um, I got lucky and I survived, couldn't find the help, but I looked around at my life and I said, okay, what do I really like to do? And I had been doing doing an event called Cruise for Troops since 2009. It was a way to, it was a car truck motorcycle cruise. Okay. It was a way to pay tribute to my dad and raise some money for veteran causes. And then in 2016, when I was, you know, looking to transition, I said, well, I really like to do that, but I don't get paid. Um, and I wanted to, you know, I realized that I, what I liked was connecting people to, you know, causes and to businesses and partnerships and things like that. Yep, sponsorship. Yep. So naturally I got into radio sales Absolutely. Um, and, and got into, got into marketing and made not a lot of money, uh, Been there. For, for, se for several years, uh, <laughs> there's not a lot of money in radio. No, I mean, <laughs> all of the, uh, all of the. You know the fringe benefits are are, are great. Well, they were great, right? Yeah. Exactly. But the regular benefits <laughs> sucked. Let's just be honest about it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it was great, but uh, no, it was it was a fun time. Um, but I ended up then meeting some people that I ended up starting a marketing company with uh, a, a guy who was a marine, and just you know, as, as things transition in my life from being a police officer and corrections officer, 911 dispatcher, stuff, you know, where I had that purpose, I, I really lacked that purpose in in other areas. And that's that's part of where Invisible Wounds Project came from was, you know, I, I, I found, like, I found myself by wanting to help others. Yep. yep. And, and I think that's pretty similar to what 
a lot of our people are. They're servants, right. and then right. they suddenly find themselves not not either you know connecting, even if they're still on the job, not connecting to what they used to do or what they're passionate about. Right. As they start to struggle, they isolate. But right. um, and I certainly did that. So, um, so for, so for missing that purpose, right. So for, for the, for folks listening, we have a, obviously a lot of first responders listening, a ton of cops that listen mm-hmm. and cop families that listen. Um, when you say rock bottom, uh, I mean, you don't have to go into any details you don't want to, but what, what led you to that point where you, you, you started looking for help. You needed help. Was it a certain well, incident I, or a cum, a cumulative stress or what was it that put, took, took you to that bottom? so to speak. Yeah. My stuff was definitely cumulative. Um, I, I can't say that there was any one particular event. Okay. Yeah. Um, it was just at some point that, I mean, I, I went from being a really good, um, dispatcher, good employee, somebody that was dedicated to someone who suddenly didn't give a crap. Right. I didn't care. Yeah. yeah. I didn't care about much of anything. I was, I wasn't a good dad. I wasn't a good, wasn't a good husband. Um, I wasn't a good employee. I was, uh, you know, contemplating suicide and, and I just I thought, well, I got to do something different. Yeah. I have to make a change. Yeah. And so I, I looked around for help and honestly, I, I, I contacted organizations that were in the area that I, I thought might be able to help. And, but because I was not a veteran, um, and even though I had been a police officer, it'd been 10 and a half years at that right. point right. since I had been a cop, it, it was, hard to really identify right you know and for people to be like and again this was 2016 a lot has changed in the eight years absolutely um eight nine years since then yep um as well and and actually that was 2015 i left in 2016 so it was was nine years ago okay Okay. but how how we talk about mental health and and how it's accepted and and yeah, being okay to have that conversation, I think it's very different. Than, oh my gosh, absolutely. Um, you know, we, when, when I, yeah, well, in, in the podcast, we often talk about cumulative stress as being like a pond. Everybody has their pond and every incident that you are involved in or get exposed to is a, a, a stone that gets thrown into that pond. Some of them are big stones, some mm-hmm. of them are small stones and, um, and, you know, if you go to, a, we go to a domestic assault, for example, and, um, that's a pretty big stone. That's a big, that's kind of a heavy weight to deal with. And so you take that stone, you throw it in your pond, it creates a ripple effect. That ripple effect spreads out and lasts for a while, but eventually that water calms down. And, uh, every, every incident after that, there, it's a stone that you throw into that pond. And, and while the, the, the water on top calms down, everything looks fine at the surface, Underneath that that pile of rock just keeps building up until it's gonna it's gonna bust that surface and 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 it's got to go somewhere. And yeah. um, I, I I'm often dest- describe cumulative stress that way. And that and that um, yeah, you know you got you got to address that. And uh, we we were never yeah. taught in law enforcement. We were never we, we were never taught that in the in twenty years ago or 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 in in a lot of cases even ten years ago they didn't talk about cumulative stress. They didn't talk about no. mental health, uh, mental health with cops and, and, uh, um, you know, just being, being aware of and, and keeping an eye on your partners to make sure they're okay and looking for the warning signs and, and so on and so forth. We didn't have any of that then. That was all to me, I guess in my mind, especially 20 years ago, 25 years ago when I started, that was talked about with military and, it, it, and, mm-hmm. and they just didn't talk about that with, with first responders. And, um, and you, for example, you, you, I talk about dispatch a lot in, in being uh, a profession where these guys are taking every call. Every call that comes in, everybody that's calling to, to, for help, you got one two, in some of the smaller agencies, one, two, three dispatchers that are taking all those calls and armchair quarterbacking all these incidents and, and trying to negotiate and navigate everything for the officers that are responding. They're dealing with all the stress. Um, and I, and I always talked, I, I, having been a dispatcher, cause I worked in dispatch too, before I went on the road and uh, on the road, I get to take one call at a time. You know, I'm not, I'm not yep. dealing with the stress of every call that's going on on, especially a Friday night or a Saturday night. And the, just, just having sat in that chair and back when I dispatched, oftentimes it was just one of us in there. And, uh, when, yeah. the, when, uh, when shit hit the fan. Um, it, it, it was crazy in there. It got so stressful. And I, 
I, I, I am so, I'm so appreciative of our dispatchers because, uh, or public safety telecommunicators or whatever the term is you want to use for them. Yeah. Um, yep. Our, our yep. emergency 911 dispatchers, I have so much appreciation for them because I've sat in that chair and um, it's a ton of stress. So we got to take care of everybody. You were in dispatch, you were on the road, um, you were in corrections. That's a whole nother different level of stress uh, working in corrections. And, um, so then you, then how did, how did an invisible wounds project start? I mean, that, that, that your experience is what led you to recognize the need for it. How did you get it started? Yeah. So I recognize that we, we had to do something with first responders. And when I say first responders, I mean, we work with military, of course, but then we work with police, fire, EMS, frontline medical staff. So nurses, hospital staff, corrections, 911 dispatch, and then also their family. So I kind of looked at everything. I said, okay, all these other groups are dealing with the same stuff that, um, or s- very similar issues that our, our veterans are dealing with. Right. You know, and this is, this is mid, you know, 20, this is 2015 or mid, mid 2010. So 2016, 2017, when this was coming to fruition yep, yep. and you know, the, we're at the tail end of, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're seeing all kinds of stuff, you know, 22 veterans a day. And the public recognized that, but they didn't recognize that all these things that were happening with veterans, I saw that happening with myself, with people I knew who were cops and firefighters and nurses and, and medics and all that. I, I looked at that group and I said, we're, we're all dealing with the same, like, Shit sandwich. Right, right. It's just different bread. Right, right. You know, absolutely. We, we all have a little different lens. You know, our trauma comes in a little different form, but we're all dealing with trauma and there's not a whole lot out there for anybody to get help with. Right. So we took what was Cruise for Troops and it was a, you know, it's a single day car event and, you know, car truck motorcycle cruise that we always hold, you know, the fourth Saturday of September. But we took that concept. And I say we, because there was me and a, a couple other volunteers who um, had been doing, you know, the lion's share of, you know, work with that. And we took that and said, all right, I want to do something that serves first responders. I don't want people to ever be told. No. Right. Um, right. Nope. We can't help you because you're not, you're not a vet. Right. So we're going to work with first responders as well. And, and that, that's where Invisible Wounds Project came from. And it stayed for many years. It, it, it did stay just as a few events, yep. right? We, like we did a beer bash, but it, it was primarily the car truck motorcycle cruise, which is now called Cruise for Heroes because we wanted to move away from just identifying as veterans. Right. Um, so yep. Cruise for Heroes, it, it falls into all of our people um, and, and identifies that way. So we did that. It started to pick up a lot of momentum. Um, our original plan, uh, original goal was just to, to you know, provide access to therapy. So we partnered, we had, you know, one of our great original partners was um, Acres for Life, which is up in Forest Lake. And they do equine therapy and work with, you know, work with the people that we work with. And so pretty much everybody that would, that we would get would just, we'd just send them there. And then we were covering, you know, we were covering the bill for people. So it was, we got them in, it was free therapy services. Things kind of started to really take off you know, after obviously we had, we had the pandemic, uh, yep. with, with COVID, which affected our, our people dramatically. Right. Um, not only our people, but just society in general. In general, correct. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a great thing for our mental health, but then we had Minnesota was a hotbed for civil unrest. We had Floyd, yeah. we had, you know, Brooklyn center shooting. We had, uh, and, and just prior to that, I mean, actually in 2016 was Orlando Castillo yep. and uh, St. Anthony, which is, here at, in Falcon Heights, but I had worked with him, and that was a you know department that I knew those people really well, great people, you know, and I saw just how deeply that impacted them, and and I, I just think that was that was part of the start of everything starting to go south. So, um, Invisible Wounds Project, you help first responders, law enforcement, EMS, mm-hmm. fire, also military, um, but you're with with everything that's gone on here in Minnesota. What kind of trends have you noticed with numbers with uh, with our first responders, and and how do those numbers change, or or how do the calls change when when you have an incident like 
um, you know, like one of the one of the shootings or the or the most recent uh, Minneapolis shooting. Yeah, well, we certainly see uh, an uptick, um, and that's that's one of the things that I mean we see it time and time again when we when we have a critical incident with you know we had we had the Burnsville shooting this year and then uh, we had Jamal Mitchell yeah. and yep. uh, when when we see those events happen, we then see a significant increase in mental health. Uh, within our first responders, especially. I was going to say, and not just cops. Uh, no, I mean, I mean, there was a week, well, the week following, 10 day period following uh, Jamal Mitchell, we lost five people that we could, that we could serve to suicide. That were all first responders. Uh, you know, those that. are all first responders. We had actually three. So what we call all first responders, three of them were nurses. Yeah. Um, yep. Including including the nurse that took care of Jamal Mitchell at the hospital uh, that oh, night he he died of suicide and um, I think people somewhat know about that but I mean that just drives home you know just what we're dealing with and that it doesn't just impact the people that are even involved in that call but it it impacts our community of first responders, first responders. as a whole yeah yep. and that never uh, get and that and, never gets reported on. You don't ever no, hear and, that. And honestly, I don't think so. When you, you, you know, we, we talk about, I think you shared a stat earlier, maybe it was before we even got on this, um, you know, what, 184 police officer suicides last year. I would say that's probably so far underreported that. Yo, absolutely you know, it, it is. It, it's, yeah. we know about things that are happening because we know and we work in it. I mean, it's, it's not reported that way. Right. Unless you're working in it, no, you don't really know that happening as much as it really is and um it's it's critical that i think we start shedding we, we got to start shedding more light on it and that it is it is happening we got to do something more about it it's it needs to be a, a, a consolidated an, a true effort right to make a difference on multiple levels but you know answer your question though it, when we have these critical incidents i myself and, and our staff and volunteers, we kind of gear up because we know it's going to happen. Probably a wave coming and yeah. we want to try to try to prep for that. And we're doing, you know, we're working on doing a lot more outreach, um, letting people know that we're there, letting people know that there is, there are services available and that they're not alone. Right. We, we've got our support center now that uh, we opened in Forest Lake, which allows us to just serve a lot more people. Yeah, describe that for um, people. That's something that's something just opened, and I think yes. it's absolutely an incredible uh, project and property um, supporting our first responders. Explain to people the, the, the building, what, it, what kind of services it provides, and how it supports these folks. Yeah, so the support center is it's a one-of-a-kind facility, and it's 11,000 square feet. It, it's a therapeutic, safe space uh, where our people can go and – and just be themselves and connect with other people who, who get them and understand them and are never going to ask, you know, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? You know, nothing like that stuff that conversations that might come up in other places they don't really come up here. Right. Um, in that same manner. And we have a different sense of humor, if you will. I think you know that. I think yep. probably anyone who's listening to this podcast understands that what we say to each other and outside of like the normal public ears is very different than the normal public might say to each other. Our water cooler uh, talk is a bit different <laughs> than most. We, we have a different version. There's, yes, we do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's very true. Uh, <laughs> so it, it's a place where our people can go be themselves and connect with other people who get them. We've got a wood shop. We've got an art studio. We've got a laser room. We've got a therapeutic room. Uh, we've got a lounge. So our, uh, our lounge, which, um, BNF Fastener Supply, they're a, uh, they're a, a awesome company up here in Ramsey, Minnesota is their base. And they love veterans and first responders. And they stepped up huge to sponsor this lounge. Um, we've got a pool table. Dartboard, bubble hockey, foosball, TVs, you know, it's, it's, it's a really nice space. It's, a, it's an amazing, uh, amazing space. And then, then we've got the, um, the coffee bar, which, uh, user Yakley Roland Law sponsored that. So like we have coffee every Friday from 8.30 to 10, um, coffee and donuts. So that should perk a few ears up, you know? That's cool. Um, and <laughs> energy we, rings, we've got coffee. energy yeah. rings, not yeah. donuts. 
Yeah. Pro, pro, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, oh, no. it is meant to be a place for people to go connect and, and, and just, just connect to each other. You know, I talked about it a little bit earlier when I, I, I talked about my struggle leaving a career that I thought I'd have forever. Right. Well, at some point we all leave, whether we leave because we retire because, you know, we're getting old right. or older. I shouldn't say old. Like I don't me. know. Is that yeah, what you're yeah. saying? I, think I wasn't going to say that's that. That's where you're going. I know. I get it. I get it. Whatever. You know, once <laughs> once we get older and we retire or we have a medical issue, right? whether it's physical or PTSD, and, and we have to leave that way, or we just up and say, you know what? I mean, when I left in 2016, I didn't go the PTSD route. I didn't even know that was an option. Right. Right. I was just like, I got to get the heck out of here because I need to save my life. So okay. And if I don't, I'm gonna be dead. So what about what about guys and gals that are that are younger or in their the mm-hmm. early stages of their careers, don't want to leave, know right. that they have uh, issues that they need to address, but are afraid to come forward and ask for help because they don't want their gun taken away or their badge taken away or their or uh, you yep. know what, whatever the case may be. How how do you how do you how do you comfort them? How do you let them know? How do you deal with that stigma? Well, and again, I think where we're at now versus nine years ago is very different. Very different. Um, yeah, I, I do think that there's a, a lot more, there's, it's a lot more open-minded with that. I do know, um, though, I do know really, administrators, though, that are still very suspect, of, yeah. especially of younger uh, first responders who go out on PTSD. And that's a lot yeah. of the old folks, you know, and not, I shouldn't say old folks, yeah. but you know, the older, the older veterans that are like, well, we never, yeah. you know, we never had yeah, that. Suck it up and yeah, suck it up and that's your suck job. Suck it up and pull it by the bootstrap. Exactly. That's, that's, and that's, that's the era that I grew up in. That's and, what I was taught. That's the way I was taught. And that doesn't work, but right. we still have some of those guys around. Yeah. And, and around. gals. Yeah. I mean, it's, no, it's not just guys, it's gals that it also have that mentality. Yeah, it is both. And, uh, so, you know, you, you bring up a good point. And, and one, this is a support center. It's, we don't have, we offer access to therapy services. So we have great therapists that um, they might volunteer out of the support center and, and just be there. But, you know, you might be playing, you might be playing bags with them. You might be playing pool with them. They might be making a copy. It's, they're, it's, they're, they're a part of the community, but yep. you're, you don't come in every Tuesday at 10 a.m. and get your appointment with your therapist. Right. If that right, makes sense. Right. It's, Agreed. Yep. I now, understand. because the average therapist can see 20 to 25 people on their client list. Okay. After that, they get too saturated. They don't have enough room. Well, we've had over 400 people the last two years. I mean, wow. if I start dividing that out and say, okay, how many of those people need therapists? How many therapists do we have to staff in there? We wouldn't have room to have any other office. Right, right. And those offices and those therapists and those therapy, you know, spaces already exist. So our goal really is to, you know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to do something that is that's different. Yep. And Agreed. and that doesn't exist. And that's that's really where that's that's where we shine. We're doing something that's different. It's not been done before. So we are kind of um, having to. I guess make it up a little bit as we go on yeah. uh, what works, what doesn't work. Right, right. But right. it's about trying to keep people healthy. We, we're not, we don't want people to leave their job. We don't want people to go out on PTSD. Ultimately, what we want is we want people to be able to get help so that they can remain in their career and they can remain great people and great servants to um, the community. Yep, exactly. Um, yep. And, and that's, the people that leave um, due to PTSD, they don't want to leave either. They're, a lot of times they're stuck having to leave. Right. They don't have a lot of options. Yep. You know, and truthfully, once they have to go that route, it's an uphill battle for them. Right. Um, and, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir out there on this, you know, audience, but it is an uphill battle. But our, our goal is to so- support people through that battle so that they, you know, they can get paired up with somebody who's been through that and they can, you know, the support center is a community center almost where you get to talk to other people who get it. They've been there, yep. you know, but it's, it's not a place where we sit there and, you know, go tell war stories and this and that. It's really about, it's growth. Right. It's healthy. We don't have alcohol being served there. You know, it's a, it's a spot where um, we do training, we do education, we do groups, you know, and a lot of that stuff is just starting to get rolled out. But yeah. 
That's awesome. Um, now, I mean, we have we have something going on every day, Monday through Friday, through the Invisible Wounds Project right now. We've got a walking group on Monday, walking group on Tuesday. We've got the um, walking group on Wednesday. We've got one on Thursday. And then we've got, on Friday, we have the coffee and connections piece at the support center. Now, the, the walking groups rotate around location. Um, we always have them once a week at the same spot. So people can go to our website and find that information out for our events tab, yep. um, iwproject.org, and click on events, and you'll see just all the different things. But we're also doing assist training, which is, I'm going to screw it up, but it's basically it's a suicide prevention training. Um, yep. And it's a two-day course. We have that coming up. Now, is that um, something for showing a film? Would, would that be something for um, a, a, a good training for Cleos, uh, chiefs or sheriffs would, or administrators? Honestly, it, it it's a good training for anybody for that anybody. deals with anyone because, it, and especially, so when you look at you know when you look at uh, on the first responder side, how often are you dealing with somebody that might be suicidal? Oh yeah. yeah. Now yeah. all the time. Yep. Um, Having the tools to know how to have that conversation and being able to have the confidence to have the conversations and ask the hard questions right. that we often get intimidated by, you know, yeah, that's huge. Um, asking somebody, you know, you see something, you hear something, it's hard to, it's sometimes hard for people to ask, you know, are you suicidal? Do you have plans to kill yourself? Right. Yeah. You know, and, and that's something especially. And, and even on the on the first responder side, we might have some of that training and that ability to ask that. But you know who we don't ask that of? Our partners. Yeah, we're yeah. we're afraid to have that conversation and ask that question about our partners. Yeah, that's true. We see these red flags. We see suddenly, you know, when I go out and speak, I talk about, you know, there's Officer Joe. Officer Joe is a mythical character. He's probably on every department in the country. Yep. Um, there's probably an officer Joe out there, but officer Joe, you know, used to be this great officer showed up early, looked great, boots looking good, great attitude, always, you know, working hard. You know, he was the one that you wanted to come into the call. He was, you know, the go getter. Suddenly things change over time. And, uh, officer Joe is, you know, shows up right at the bell, isn't looking his best. You know, he's got a stain on his shirt you know, doesn't pull his weight anymore, doesn't really, you know, doesn't have a great attitude, isn't a positive force to be around. Now is more of a negative. Yeah. Um, yeah. You start to dread when Joe shows up. And it's something that happens over time. It's not like it's overnight that that happens with most of our people, but we need to recognize it as, you know, first responders, police officers, and, and such that, how do we address that? Well, it comes on to just, Asking the question. Yeah, talking. Letting people know that we see the problem. Yeah. How can we help? Yeah. Letting them know that we're out there. Letting them know that there's other resources, but not not, not okaying that behavior. Um, but you know, just letting them know they're not alone. Yeah, acknowledging it. You like, know. Yeah. you know, taking people out. You know, if you've got a rapport with somebody, taking them out and, and having a real talk with them the way you might have with somebody on a call. Right. Right. You know, we, we tend to show a lot of compassion for um, the people that we serve. And then we're our worst critics and our, our harshest, meanest, spirited towards the people that we work with every day. Right, right. You know, and we don't do it out of hate. We do it out of thinking that it's love. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to give this guy more shit. Yeah. And yep. that's, how, that's how we show the love for each other. Yep, yep. And it's okay to do that, but we also have to then have that serious conversation say, Hey, I, I'm seeing stuff. Here. I'm worried about. It. Right. Right. Um, ah, it's so important. Yeah. So with invisible wounds project, how can people help? How are you, how is IWP funded? What can people do? Well, we do a lot of fundraisers. So we do a lot of events, you know, September is suicide prevention month. Yep. And I think this month we have nine events right now. Right. We have a lot of events and, and it's that it's, but it's donating. It's, it's making connections to people that have the ability to support and donate to the cause. Right. We run 100% off of, we run off of donations at, and, and sponsorships and people just coming to events and paying to be there, paying to support. That's how we've been able to do this. Yep. You know, again, I, I, I touched on before we used to just pay for therapy services. 
Well, at the beginning of 2022, we had 16 people that we were paying for monthly. By the end of 22, we had over 90. It was wow. it was impossible to sustain that level of funding. So that's where we kind of we, we said, okay, we got to make a change, and that's that's where the that concept of what we do now came from. Now we're building something that it doesn't just go out. You know, it it stays in a little easier too. Um, you know, so the funding, not only are we able to help more people, but we're able to do it more efficiently. Yep. Agreed. And we're able to help people access services that might already be available to them or how do they go through insurance? How do they go through EAP um, and walk them through that? But then also, if they need that financial support to get into something and it doesn't exist, okay, now we can reserve that money for those people versus just paying, just being another insurance company and paying some therapy. Right. So yep. um, it's, it's imperative that people, you know, step up and, and, and give back and, and help us make that work. You know, we've seen with the support center opening, I mean, this is the first week that we've started to open to the public. We had to get some things really set, but we've been open basically Monday through Friday, nine to five. And, you know, I think yesterday was one of our walking days and we had, I think we had 20 different people through the center, wow. um, including amazing. some who are therapists and, yep, yep. You know, some providers who wanted to come check it out because we, they then refer their clients who fit our mold right. to come check it out. Right. They need right. something more than just therapy. They need that connection. They need that social outlet that isn't the bar. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, exactly. Um, which is kind of our go to when it comes to law enforcement and first responders. We spend a lot of time yeah. doing things that aren't always the healthiest. Yep. Yeah. You know, you have a bad call. Well, hey, let's go have fire practice in the parking lot. Right. right. Or the parking ramp yeah. or you know, yeah. whatever. Yeah, I agree. So, so this is about doing something healthy and safe and different. And, you know, it's, awesome. it's not everyone's not everyone's cup of tea, but uh, we certainly are. We're filling a, a role in a niche that didn't exist and doesn't exist anywhere yeah. so that people have a place to go. And, and, and my vision of this is, you know, let's let's figure out how it works at this place and then let's let's build it beyond that yep um yep, let's, let's start expanding this but it comes down to you know funding and we're working on grants and things like that but it's, it's it's fundraising right now which you know so what it does so invisible wounds has a big 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 their big annual event coming up it's called freedom fest and um, I want to yeah. have you explain Freedom Fest. Let's we'll listen to the listen to the uh, promo here quick, and then uh, we'll be back and talk about Freedom Fest. The Invisible Wounds Project welcomes the Eli Young Band and Easton Corbett. And I know I'm all over the road. to Freedom Fest Saturday, September 28th at Running Aces Casino Hotel and Racetrack. Sponsored by BNF Faster Supply. Tickets are just $60 and support veterans and first responders. Get tickets for Freedom Fest at IWProjects.org. That's IWProjects.org. Okay, so that's Freedom Fest and it's going to be a it's just going to be a great night. Tell us about Freedom Fest and tell us tell us what to expect. It's just coming up in a few weeks. Yeah, we're just uh, we're we're in the month of September, and like I said earlier, month of September is busy, and it all culminates with Freedom Fest. So Freedom Fest was born of what is what was Truce for Troops, so and, and kind of what spawned the whole Invisible Wounds Project organization as a whole. But Freedom Fest is a great country concert um, every year. Uh, this year we've got Eli Young Band. Easton Corbin, those are our two national headliners, and then we've got local bands. Uh, great, great, we've got the Farmers Daughters, yeah, and Rafe Carlson. Yeah, so great local bands, great national acts. Our, you know, our deal is we always want to put on a great show, and we always want to have you know acts that support the cause and, and support our people. And and I think this year we've really done a great job of picking that out. It's not easy to put on a concert. This thing has it's become like, an animal a in and of, of itself. You know? Yep. Yep. And I, and I hinted it started with the car truck motorcycle cruise that uh, is now a cruise for heroes. When we started that in 2009, it was 12 cars and about 25 people in a parking lot. Wow. And yeah. um, our biggest year with that was 2019. So pre COVID, uh, we had a thousand cars, trucks, motorcycles, <laughs> um, big rigs involved and wow. um i'm hoping we get back to that it's 
you know, when, when you see all the cars and you see the trucks and the bikes and the flags and it's, a, it's, it's just so cool that, that sense of pride and community, it's, it's fun to see. I'm already praying to the weather gods that we get yep. good weather because it's been a few years where it hasn't been great. Right. And that's really for as much time as we put into this, it's, it really sucks when it's not good weather. Right. No, agreed. Um, on our end, because we look at it and go, man, people just are probably yeah. not going to show up now. And it's a ton um, of work. we have been lucky though. we have had, we have had great crowds, even though it's been, you know, not the best weather. And there was a ton of rain um, last year and the, and the so, crowds were still huge which was yeah. so cool to yeah, see. Yeah, we've got, uh, yeah, so we're we're planning for whatever weather. We're going to have a great time. We're going to have fun. So um, date, kicks off. date it's, time. It's Saturday, how, September yeah, there 28th. Yep, sub, so Saturday, yeah. September 28th. God, that's coming up too. Saturday, September 28th. Yeah. How do we get tickets? Yep, Saturday, September 28th. Go to iwproject.org, and we've got a pop-up on our website right now that'll take you right to the landing page. And it's a three-part event. So in the morning, 8 a.m., Cruise for Heroes opens up, and the Officer Sean Silvera Memorial 5K. Yep. So Officer Sean Silvera was Lionel Lake's police officer who was killed in the line of duty during a pursuit. And, you know, his widow and family put this uh, 5K on, and it benefits the Invisible Wounds Project. Uh, as well as uh, it's the Minnesota Explorer Group with a scholarship in Sean Silvera's name. So That's awesome. um, we we split the proceeds on the run to go to not only Invisible Wounds Project, but also then scholarships for explorers to pursue law enforcement careers. And so that's 8 a.m., same with Cruise for Heroes. And then uh, this year we've got uh, John DeCosmaker is going to be singing the national anthem. So John is a Navy vet. You may know him as the anthem singer for the Minnesota Wild. Yeah. Um, he's going to be out there doing that. And we do that about 1115. Um, we do our awards for the 5K and then we do the, the anthem and, and kick off some of the Cruise for Heroes presentation. And then at noon, all the vehicles leave on a cruise. And this year, um, we're going to be going right through downtown Forest Lake. So oh, cool. um, we've got law enforcement support along the way. We're going to pass by the Invisible Wounds Project Support Center and it's it's not going to be as long of a cruise distance wise, but we're going to be going through town. So it's going to be a little slower and more of a parade atmosphere. And so I think that's going to be a really fun uh, addition in that we're yeah, going to be able cool. to get spectators in the crowd and, and the community out to wave and, and show their, you know, support and patriotism. And then we've got the cars and, and, and the, the um, crews and stuff going through. And uh, I think that'll just be a really cool feel to it. Um, and then we come back and, and then there's a, a little bit of a break in the action while we convert over to focus on getting the gates for the concert set up. And then four o'clock doors open for the concert and we've got six and a half hours of music. General admission tickets are 60 bucks. It's family friendly. You're, it's a unique venue at Running Aces Casino there where there's not a bad seat in the house. No, I mean, not at you're, all. you're close to the stage almost no matter where you're at, but you can get hit passes for 125 bucks and that gets you right up to, uh, you know, right up to the edge of the stage. And, um, you know, it's, it, it's just a fun place. They've got a hotel there. It's just um, such a fun atmosphere. You know, it, I mean, the last year was, even, yeah. even with the rain, last year was so much fun. Yeah. It's just the, uh, just, I don't know. It's hard to explain unless you're there. It's just such a cool, just such a cool event. Yeah, and it, it's a patriotic crowd. We've got a, you know, we've got we've got great people that that show up and have shown up for years and years, and so that's what's yeah, that's awesome. You know, so how do people find out more? That's, how do that's they? That's what's really fun. How do they follow? What's the best way to follow the Invisible Wounds? Oh no! First of all, I forgot to ask. So we have we have listeners from all over the country and from other countries as far as that goes, but for the, for, for folks outside of Minnesota, what do you do? What do you do if somebody from say Wisconsin calls and says, Hey, I heard about your organization. I'm in Wisconsin. How, where can I, where can I get help here? Where do you have, um, uh, access to resources for those folks if they, if they call for help? Yeah. And our goal is always to make people safer. You know, sometimes we get calls from people who are not part of that group that we serve, of oh, the military right. yeah. and, and first responders. Yeah. But, our, our job is, our, you know, we just want to make them safe. And since we're throwing it out there, our phone number is 855-HELP-IWP. Okay. Um, so that's our that's our phone number. We're not a 24-7 crisis line, but we are pretty responsive and, and receptive. Our, our goal is to make people safer. So we do work, we work with a lot of people actually in Western Wisconsin. 
that's probably our second biggest area oh, okay. outside of the outside of the Twin Cities, I would say the central area of, of, Minnesota. of Minnesota. Right. Western Wisconsin is our second highest area of members. But typically clientele. typically it's just um, Minnesota, right? Typically well, no, it is it started in Minnesota, but really our we we as long as they have uh Viking colors <laughs> on, um, then, we'll, then we'll serve them. Uh, no, no I, I agree. I we concur. will even we'll, we will even serve Patrick. That's, that's how that's oh, how good. No, I no. love it. Um, we've we've molded. We've we've done some stuff in Western Wisconsin, and we've you know it's honestly from where our support center is, Western Wisconsin is thirty minutes away. Okay. So oh, yeah, I expose. Um, yeah. Just geographically, it we, we get you know we get people that way, people, but yeah. I mean, we've got people all the way up in Northern Minnesota, Southern Minnesota, across the way. Our job, our, our philosophy is if, if we can serve them, we will. Um, personally, if we can't, we will make sure that we find help for them somewhere too. Because again, the philosophy is we don't want to tell people, no, sorry, there's absolutely nothing we can do for you. Good luck. Right. That That's right. not an answer to give to somebody who is calling and looking for help right. because, a lot of times you only get that one shot. They yep. make that yep. phone call. That's the one time they're willing to pick up that phone. And if they are based, if they're poo pooed and told no, they, that might, call they might not ever ask for help again. Right. right. And, and we take that very seriously. So we get messages on Facebook. Our, our Facebook is Invisible Wounds Project. We get emails. We get, you know, we're on Instagram. We're on LinkedIn. We're on all these things. So however people can get to us, they get to us. We're starting to obviously see, you know, a fair number of walk-ins with the support center as well. So right. it's just, you know, we want people to know that, you know, they are not alone. Yeah, um, agreed. They're not the only ones going through this. They're not going to, they're not the first, they're not going to be the last. That's awesome. Um, and, and we've got a whole ton of volunteers and, and supporters that, you know, have, have walked that walk, including all of our staff that they've been there. They've, they've done that. They, they've got that firsthand experience as well. So, you know, being able to relate to people, that, that's important. It's not just, you're not just calling on somebody who doesn't know what you're going through. Right. That's awesome. We will put links to uh, the website, um, all your social media links, um, phone number and everything. We'll have that in the, in the show notes and on our website as well. Um, anything else that, that you want to add that, uh, we want to make sure people are, especially with it being, uh, it's, it's September, you know, it's, yeah, it's you know, I, it's just, you, you can check out our, our website. We've got tons of events, you know, that you can come out and support. We have a walking group in Oatana. We've got a walking group in Wasika. We do a, a meaningful connections group down in Zimbroda. We've got a walking group in Andover, one in Forest Lake and, you know, a meaningful connections in Edina. There's stuff all over the place, and and we're working to continue to expand that, um, so that we can serve more people. But one really cool event that is coming up in October as well is uh, there's a guy named Conrad Weaver, and he did a, a documentary called PTSD 911, and we're showing that documentary. He's coming from the East Coast, and we're showing that documentary uh, October 10th and 11th. It's free tickets um, at the support center, and I've seen the film. It's an incredible film. It follows a police officer. It follows a firefighter medic, and it follows a 911 dispatcher through their PTSD journey. And I, I highly encourage people, if they can't see it ours, to find a find a spot where you're going to be able to view it and, and see that movie, um, see that documentary. But I think it helps open some eyes. And then our goal with that is to not only, you know, open eyes to it, but then, hey, we, we're a resource that can help you know, right. make the changes that are needed. Right. So that information from that documentary, that's on your, that's on the website and social media yep. so they can find that there. Yep. Okay. And like I said, we'll make sure Absolutely. we have uh, those links and the notes too on the, on the page. So Russ, appreciate everything you do. Um, you, you, so many people are affected by this that, uh, uh, well, I'm just, just look at the, we just look at the numbers here in Minnesota and, um, uh, and we know it, w w with all the people who have come forward asking for help, it really, it's almost frightening to think about how many, how many haven't, you know, how many of are still out. We Correct. know there's, there's a bunch of folks out there that, that need the help. We just need to make sure that that help that they know 
you know, that they're not alone and that there's help out there Yeah, and, um, just to get them the resources that they need. So, yeah, no, and I, I appreciate you, uh, you know, having me on here and I appreciate your willingness to talk about this because not everybody has that, uh, that foresight and, and willingness to, to broach this subject. So mm-hmm. really appreciate you having me. Agreed. Thanks again, Russ. I appreciate everything you do. Good luck with Freedom Fest. Thanks. Uh, have a great one, man. If you're outside of Minnesota and are looking for resources, whether you're a first responder struggling or you know someone who's struggling or you're a first responder family who's lost someone to suicide, there are some great resources out there for you. As Russ said, they do have a network they can reach out to if you contact them for assistance. Otherwise, nationally, there's the Survivors of Blue Suicide Foundation. Now, the president is Samantha Poor and executive director Shelley Jones, both are just amazing people. This organization has a ton of resources and connections available for prevention and to support those who've lost heroes to suicide. That's a a great organization. Uh, Next one is First Help. It's another great organization. Karen Solomon is one of the heroes who are there to support our men and women serving with uh, with support, with education, and uh, and with more. It's First Help is another great organization, and we'll share the links to both of these organizations in the notes. We've done interviews with these organizations in the past. You can see those episodes, uh, previous episodes with the podcast here, and they're, I'll tell you what, simply amazing people, and they're there uh, to, to try and help prevent suicide, blue suicide, and they're uh, also there to help uh, folks that are that are dealing with the, the grief of losing someone to suicide as a first responder or in law enforcement. So for immediate help, if you or someone you know is struggling, please know there's help available now. If you or someone you know is struggling with suicidal thoughts, help is available 24-7 from the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by calling 988 on your cell phone or 1-800-273-TALK. That's 988 on your cell phone or 1-800-273-TALK. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this important episode. And thank you in advance for sharing this episode with friends and family. Please keep an eye on your partners if you're out there serving in our communities. And know that what you do and the sacrifices that you make for your community are so greatly appreciated. That being said, you also have to take care of you. You can't be the best you can be on the road. You can't stay safe. You can't keep your partners safe if you aren't taking care of your mental health health. There's help out there, and you aren't alone. Thanks again, and God bless our first responders. Please stay safe out there, everyone. Walking eastbound, walking eastbound. Thank you for listening to this special edition of the Officer Down Memorial Podcast. 